Currents form when an electric potential difference is created by a battery, capacitor, or some other type of voltage source. There is a potential difference that is created by these devices, and when connected to conducting materials, create an electric field that exerts a force on the charges on the conductor, causing them to flow. As you might imagine, the amount of current that flows through a circuit is proportional to the voltage applied by the source. But really, the reason we have circuits is to power things, like a light bulb. Take the simple circuit represented here. The amount of current that will run through a light bulb is driven by the amount of voltage provided by the battery. This direct relationship between voltage and current is known as Ohm's law. The electric property that impedes current is called resistance. This is roughly analogous to friction and mechanical motion in that both friction and resistance act against the motion. The unit for resistance is ohms and is represented by the Greek letter omega. Resistance is caused by the particles in a substance transferring their energy as they collide with other particles. So the more there is a, a transfer of energy, the more resistance a substance has and the less the current will flow. So current and resistance have an inverse relationship. Since current is directly proportional to voltage and inversely proportional to resistance, we can combine these two proportions and expand on Ohm's law. So Ohm's law does a good job of describing the resistance of certain materials. This actually tells us that the current flowing through a conducting circuit is directly proportional to the voltage being applied. Resistance is labeled with a Greek letter omega, and the units of resistance turn out to be 1 ohm equal to 1 volt per ampere. So what is the resistance of a headlight through which 2.5 amps flows when 12 volts is applied? Well, we know the current and we know voltage, and we can rearrange Ohm's law to solve for resistance. Our 12 volts divided by 2.5 amperes gives us 4.80 ohms of resistance. This is a pretty small resistance. What we will see is that resistance can change within a circuit when things like temperature change. Depending on the material, resistance can vary by several orders of magnitude. For example, a large diameter copper wire will have a resistance in the area of 10 to the negative fifth ohms. This small number makes sense when you think about the fact that we use copper wire to carry current. We would want a small resistance so we can transfer the large amount of energy and not lose a lot of it. On the other hand, the ceramic insulators that support those same power lines can have resistances on the order of 10 to the 12th ohms. Again, this makes sense since we do not want our current to be carried outside of those particular wires. We can also rearrange Ohm's law to solve for the voltage. In this context, we are referring to the voltage drop across a resistor produced by some current. In fact, you will often hear the phrase IR drop used to describe the voltage. So the voltage across a resistor is equal to the current going through it times the resistance of the resistor. The voltage across a resistor can be measured with a voltmeter. Voltmeters can accurately measure the voltage because they really have an infinite resistance. This means that we can put a voltmeter anywhere in our circuit and not disturb the circuit, and the current continues through the circuit without going through the voltmeter. Interestingly, voltage will change depending on where you add the voltmeter. If you measure the voltage across the resistor, it will measure lower than if you measure closer to the battery. A good analogy is fluid pressure. If you imagine the battery is pumping out current in a way that a well pumps out water, there's a pressure difference, or in this case potential difference, that is created and causes the flow through the circuit. You can then think of the resistor as a pipe that the water must flow through. When this happens, the pressure is reduced and the flow is limited. The same thing happens to the current as it flows through the resistor. The resistor converts the electric energy into another form, such as light energy in the case of our headlight. So the energy supplied by the voltage source and the energy converted by the resistor are equal. If we take a sample of wire of some material, we can describe its physical properties such as length and area to help us determine the amount of resistance in a given wire. Take the length of the wire. The longer the wire, the further the electricity has to go, so it is more difficult for the electricity to get through the wire. The cross-sectional area also plays a part in the resistance. If you relate this to a straw and how much of a milkshake you can get to pass through the straw of a given size, and compare that to the amount of milkshake you can get to pass through a coffee stirrer, you can kind of see how the area is going to affect the resistance. Trying to use a coffee stirrer will give you a headache because the cross-sectional area is so much smaller. It makes it very difficult to get the milkshake through. It just simply cannot handle the flow. The same thing happens to current moving through a wire. The larger the area, the less resistance to the flow of current. So resistance and area have an inverse relationship. 
The total resistance also depends on the type of substance the wire is made of. This is accounted for in a constant, rho, called the resistivity. The smaller the value for the resistivity, the less resistance the material supplies to the current. We can express resistance mathematically by taking the length times the resistivity divided by the cross-sectional area. A lot of our wiring is made of copper. This is because it has a very low resistivity, so we can make small, long wires that carry the current very well. Silver has an even smaller resistivity and can be used in wiring, however it is a lot more expensive. Aluminum has a slightly higher resistivity than copper, but it is very abundant and very cheap, so we can get a comparable wire by making it a little bit wider. Suppose a headlight filament is made of tungsten and has a cold resistance of 0.350 ohms. If the filament is a cylinder 4 centimeters long, what is the diameter? Well, let's see, we know the resistance and the length of the wire, and we can look up the resistivity. So we can solve for the area, and since the wire is a cylinder, we know we can find the area by taking pi times the radius squared. Solving for the radius squared and then the square rooting it gives us 4.51 times 10 to the negative fifth meters. And we know that diameter is 2 times the radius, so we get 9 times 10 to the negative fifth meters. This is really a very small diameter, and when you look at that number, it might be a little bit hard to comprehend. So to put that in a little better perspective, we can say that the diameter is just under a tenth of a millimeter in length. Now all of this depends on temperature. If the temperature of the wire increases, the speed of the particles increase. This is going to make it more difficult for the charges to move through the wire and therefore increase the resistivity. Colder temperatures cause the particles to slow down, thereby decreasing the resistance. For example, if we look at a graph of the resistance of mercury as the temperature decreases, what we see is a slight decrease for a while and then suddenly the resistance drops off. So at that critical temperature, mercury becomes a perfect conductor or a superconductor.